also they're so excessively concerned with homosexuality. I never had any problem with being homosexual. I've always been right out there. I was always an object of desire. <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> when I was in school, I was, I was pretty <laughs> and amusing, very popular. Everybody wanted to go to bed with me, <laughs> from the headmaster on down. <laughs> I'm practically the number one person around who said everybody, who everybody else said was straight. <laughs> <laughs> I think most people don't have any idea what their sexual identity is. I've always said that if you decide you want somebody, I don't care who they are, if you really want them and you concentrate exclusively, you'll probably get that person. That's been my experience. Very few people can resist you know, when someone really, really wants them. When when someone focuses totally, totally on them. One, it's so flattering. And two, if it goes on long enough, just wears them down. <laughs> energy helps, too. <laughs> and I'm very energetic when the occasion arises. The main thing about me is that I'm not like, it's not like anybody else. And most homosexuals are very ordinary ordinary people but not me there's there's nothing ordinary about me i was always a sort of two-headed calf <laughs> well, <laughs> i was aware of this at a very early age for openers i'm distinctly curious looking right wouldn't you agree <laughs> and everyone's always making allusions to this weird little voice capote has Hi, and childish, of course, then describing me as delicate. I'm as delicate as a pit bull. <laughs> In actual fact, I have a sturdy peasant frame. I'm a good athlete, an excellent swimmer and diver, and what else? I'm a good businessman. I'm responsible with money. And my age, I, n I never tell my age. I'm 51. <laughs> And for 51 years, as long as I, I can remember, I've lived with this, this feeling of dread. Just a belief that any minute something terrible is going to happen, like you're on the drop of the gallows. Oh. I mean, I have literally stood and watched people on the drop of the gallows. I've held their hand a minute before, just watched them drop, and their heads jerk back and their feet dancing. That moment before it's going to happen, I believe I know how that moment feels. When I researched in cold blood, I interviewed literally hundreds of convicted murderers, and many of them on death row. And once in Hong Kong, I was walking through the market, and I saw all these little dogs in these bamboo cages, and the cages were stacked on top of each other. Little dogs were stuffed inside, very passive, not yapping, nothing. It was very hot, and I couldn't imagine what in the world they were there for, so I asked the Chinese girl, who I was with, and she said, oh, they're for sale. They're waiting to be eaten. Soup is made of those little dogs. And that was many years ago. But the first time I saw death row in one of our prisons, all I could think about were those little dogs. I identified with those little dogs and those convicted killers. Where did I get this one from? How come? <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> These 
these are fabric swatches for my editor, Joe Fox. I'm giving him a three-piece custom-made suit from Dunhills. It'll change his life. <laughs> Have you ever fantasized killing somebody? You haven't? No. Cross your heart. <laughs> well, I still don't believe it. Everybody's wanted to kill somebody at one time or another. <laughs> As for me, if desire had ever been transformed into action, I'd been right up there with Jack the Ripper. <laughs> Plotting murder is somewhat relaxing. but not relaxing enough. I'm seldom able to sleep without chemical aid. I feel as if I've never spent a tranquil moment in my life. And it's reasonable to assume this monstrous anxiety of mine comes from being an unwanted child. My parents separated soon after I was born. My mother quickly realized what a big mistake she'd made. My mother, she was very pretty. <laughs> and other men entered her life. And she just left me with her three maiden sisters, an unmarried brother in Monroeville, Alabama. Population 1,000, 300, and a few odd souls. And I can, I can remember just standing in the street, just watching my mother just drive off, just getting smaller and smaller and smaller. The family wasn't unkind to me that she left me with, in a way it was very hard on them, because they definitely thought something was wrong with me. <laughs> Isn't that strange? <laughs> I'm very ambivalent about Christmas. I want it to be magic, just warm and lavish with all your friends, like a family, which sets up this terrible anxiety, because I have a terrible history with Christmases, and that's true with most alcoholics, you know. Things, just things happen. And this year is notable for the painful number of absent friends. And, and I don't mean that crowd. I mean like Jack. I asked him not to go to Switzerland this year, but to stay and see me through this Christmas. But as usual, he escaped. <laughs> Jack Dunkley and I have been together for almost 30 years. Lovers for three. Best friends closest companions ever since. We, we've been through it all together. <laughs> together, but not necessarily under the same roof or during my more trying periods on the same continent. Well, oh. <laughs> well, <coughs> who am I doing this for? I had thought this Christmas with most of the city celebrants behaving as if I were spreading cholera. Maybe he'd stick around and just offer a little support. And on my split, my split with Billy, 